This is You and Yours, introduced by Nancy Wise. Hello, and I'm sure that you'll find something of interest in today's edition of You and Yours, for in the programme we're covering many varied items. Another in the series of family budgets, there's a report on how to take a cheap holiday, and we'll be discussing arthritis, that painful and disabling disease. And of course there'll be your comments in What's on Your Mind. David Scott Blackall was seething with something on his mind last week and wrote... On Tuesday, I booked an ordinary return from my local station at L Street to St Pancras. There is no advantage in taking a return. It costs twice the normal fare, but it does save time at the booking office, both for the traveller and the railway staff. I was given a lift home from town and so didn't use the return half. On Thursday, I had to travel from L Street to St Pancras again, and in my innocence, I presented my unused return half at the window, saying... I didn't use this, so I want to trade it in for a single to St Pancras. The clerk regarded me as if I'd come from another planet and said, These tickets are available on the day of issue only. You've lost your money. I thought it was the most elementary principle that you don't pay for what you haven't had. And the result of this is I will never book a return again. British Rail have conned me out of 48 pence. As a practical suggestion, why doesn't British Rail issue books of tickets from local stations to town so they could be used in either direction as required? Well, we phoned British Rail for a comment and they said that tickets cannot be exchanged or money refunded for such short distances because the clerical charge would come to more than the value of the ticket. British Rail are at no time under any obligation to refund fares, even on long-distance tickets purchased and not used, but they do take a sympathetic view when there's a valid reason for the ticket not being used, and money is sometimes refunded, but a deduction is made for the clerical work involved there. And it is quite clearly stated on the tickets when they're bought that they're valid for one day only. Tickets were made valid for one day instead of three-month return, as they were at one time, because of fraud. People weren't giving up their ticket at the barrier at the end of the journey and were using the return half as often as they could, and it's unfortunate that honest people now have to suffer because of the ones who were dishonest. And British Rail have experimented with books of tickets, but again, it's difficult to avoid fraud. And now for the latest in our series about family budgets, the eternal problem of making ends meet. Joan York reports. About 40% of all married women now go out to work, a good many of them part-time. Mrs J of Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire is one of them. She doesn't have to work, but her wages mean that the family can live more comfortably and worry less about money than they could otherwise. Her husband's a caretaker on a GLC estate, and his job provides one valuable perk. The accommodation's free, um, which includes the telephone and central heating. And the rates? And the rates, that's all inclusive, yes. We just have our own gas bill to pay, you know, I cook by gas. And what does he earn? Well, it varies from probably about 22 to 28 a week, according to stoppages. Do you have to help him at all? I don't have to help. You can get involved. You know, our estate consists of um, all old age pensioners, you know, all retired. Oh, yes. And um, you just can't help getting involved. But as well as that, you work part time yourself, don't you? Yes, I go out to work in the afternoons. It's roughly four hours a day, um, slightly more on Saturdays. Mm. And um, I work for the local bookmaker and I quite enjoy it. Besides, I'm getting paid as well. <laughs> How much yes. do you get for that? I get £2.10 a day. So their combined income is about £40 a week. A good deal of it is spent on clothes and food because Mrs J has three hungry sons to bring up. I have one of 12, one of nine, and the youngest one is three now. So a certain amount of wear and tear, I imagine, oh, <laughs> goes so on it? them. Yes. <laughs> Um, I find especially on clothing and shoes, well, every time I look round, one of them needs shoes. And the prices of the boys' shoes, I pay more for my eldest son's shoes than I do for my own. For a good, strong school shoe, they call him a small man now. He's in a seven, and he's only 12. 
and we paid four pounds ten for his last pair of shoes. Now I wouldn't dream of paying that for my shoes. Do they have school meals? The children, well, the the two elder ones. Um, well, the biggest one doesn't. He's not all that keen on them. Um, the middle one does. He loves it. It's sixty pence a week, but um, from what he tells me, he gets. You couldn't do it at home on twelve pence a day because he comes home after having two lots of dinner and even as much as three helpings of afters. And, you know, you just can't do it at 12 pence a day. Mm. It's fantastic. But he doesn't get any fatter on it. It's so thin, it's unbelievable. She provides a midday meal for her husband and her other two sons and an evening meal for the whole family. The housekeeping arrangements are pretty informal. Her husband tends to pay the bigger bills, shoes and clothes, gas and electricity, but there are no fixed rules about it, and Mrs J doesn't have a fixed housekeeping allowance. I never want a, a sum such as £20 a week to manage on because I can't manage. I would rather have half the amount and mm. put the other half away because I used to be a very bad manager. Um, we shopped together, a big bulk shop, you know, on a Thursday, and then apart from that, I just buy odds and ends. I've always plenty of money on hand, but never a set housekeeping wage. Do you know what you spend a week then? Yes, roughly? I know what I spend a week, yeah. yes. What's that? Um, well, Thursday, when we say a big shop, which is your soap powders and tin stuff and that, comes from anywhere between about 3.15 to 4.5, four, four pounds five a week. And I spend about... £2.10 for the Saturday meat with the Sunday joint as well. Um, and then, of course, there's all the other odds and ends, your fruit. You know. Green groceries, a lot, and, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. salad, you know, because we're all very keen on salad. I find I spend quite a bit on that. Probably might come to about £2 a week, you know, by the time you bought salad about three times. So it would come out at about £10 a week, probably, would probably, it? Probably, yes, in just, in just the food. There are some things she regularly buys in the supermarket, household items and tinned food, for example. But apart from that, she tends to shop around, looking for pennies off, special offers and good quality. I don't believe in being true to one shop. If I can get a bargain in one shop, I'll get it. And I'll just walk out and I'll walk in with their carry bag and shop in another shop <laughs> for the rest, you know. I just don't mind at all. What about meat? Um, meat, I have a most marvellous butcher across the road. Um, very reliable. I just ask what I want, say how much I'm willing to pay for it, such as the weekend joint. I probably say to him, a piece of lamb, please, about a pound, and I can pick it up on the Saturday and, you know, it's a marvellous piece of meat. You wouldn't buy meat in supermarkets? I, I wouldn't buy meat in supermarkets, no. I've tried and I've not been too keen. If the price of meat, for example, goes on going up, I mean, will you start buying cheaper cuts and so on? We used to at one time, you know, when the family was young and I couldn't stay in regular employment, you know, if the children were ill. But no, I don't think so. I don't think you can economise on meat, for one thing. Other things, though? I don't always believe that the higher price tomatoes are the best and so on with your vegetables. Um, we've seen, you know, some elaborate grocers in the East End. We are East End people originally. And you go up and you see these apples two shillings a pound, but what they want to give you out of a box, you know, behind the big show, is not worth a shilling a pound. You're really we... pretty careful about the way you choose your vegetables. Oh, yes. Mrs J doesn't think of her own wages as money to spend on herself. In fact, it's her money which looks after the family's only hire purchase commitment. We are running a car. Um, we sold a smaller car and got this bigger one, and it means we are paying the rest on... I purchase. Well, this I pay regular as clockwork. As soon as I'm paid on a Friday and I finish work, I go into the car showrooms and I pay five pounds. So, you know, this is five pounds of my money gone. Mm. You don't feel, oh, this is mine, I must put it away. Oh, no, no. I just couldn't put it away anyway because <laughs> I, I always find I need something for the children or myself. My husband feels he doesn't get enough out of it probably, but, you know, I'm paying for the car, so mm. here you are. Incidentally, the Jays have rather a sensible arrangement by which they pay for the car's tax and insurance on a weekly basis, rather than in that frightening lump sum, and the tax and insurance that way works out at about 30 bob a week. So about half the family's income is spent either on the car, if you include petrol, or on food, if you include school meals. A good deal of what's left goes on household goods and clothes for a growing family. But what about luxuries? 
Cigarettes, for example. I do smoke, yes. I smoke um, mm. cigarette. They're a kind of cigarette, cigar, you know. Yeah. And I probably smoke between 10 and 15 a day. Do you entertain much at home? You know, do you well, have friends in? No, not a lot because of my husband's duties. And um, Thursday I tend to play bingo once a week on Thursday, which is my husband's evening off, so we don't really get many visitors mm. at all. We revolve around the children. They play football for the Sunday league, you see. And, of course, that means Sundays at home. Yes. And dear mum's secretary and has the kit to wash and... So this is more expense on the washing powder and more time I have to find. But it's all around the children, really, you know. Mm. What about drink? Do you spend much on that? No, I don't like to drink. Mm -hmm. I'll drink for an occasion if somebody comes, you know, and that's probably our limit. Except at Christmas we will get spirits in for others to come. Holidays? I imagine you, you save up for holidays, do you? Oh, yes, that's a must, you know, to get away in our job, being resident. What do you spend roughly on holidays? Spend roughly? Well, this is the cheapest one we've had this year because we're going earlier in June and it's worked out. We're going to Cornwall at £20 a week to self-cater in a flat. But do you save, actually, for holidays? Do you put money away? Yes, we don't... I don't say we put money away every week because this isn't possible. But, you know, we have a run on putting money away. It might go on for about five weeks. And then my husband will give me so much one week and it might be about £20. And the following week I've still got it in my purse, it hasn't gone away. Well, if anything's come up in the meantime, it will be paid out of this rather than write a cheque. But we only save on the one bank account, which is my husband's. You haven't got one of your own? No, not of my own. Well, we well, can't afford to run two. No. <laughs> and um, I'm not very reliable, I don't think, running out and drawing cheques. I wouldn't have anything in, you know. <laughs> I'd leave it long enough. Report there from Joan York and Mrs J and family are off on their budget holiday in Cornwall. Well, Tim Matthews recently talked about a method of exchanging your house in England with a family in America. A number of listeners said that the airfare to America was too expensive to make such a holiday really feasible. In fact, the average man in Britain only spends £20 on an annual holiday, which he spreads over 10 days. We asked Tim Matthews to find out what sort of holiday he could get on this modest budget. Well, inevitably, I found the published rates of hotels, villas, caravans, tents and other sheltering places already lag behind the actual prices, and I can only assume that the statistic of £20 a head has therefore also nudged its way up. So all I can say is that the holidays I've worked out jolly nearly can be squeezed in on 20 quid, give or take a modest few new pence. Now, since I don't consider 10 days sitting at a communal formica-top table eating fish fingers much of a holiday, I set myself against any organised cheap package tours and I set out to see what I could accomplish by myself. First, at home. In fact, I was so successful in my first attempt that I'm rather loath to tell you about it at all. All I'll do is give a few clues. Taking one of those glossy country magazines, I looked through the small advertisements on the back pages for accommodation and came up with a Queen Anne rectory recommended by Egon Roney and the Good Food Guide not 50 miles from Gloucester which offered full board, off-season, at a price which could just be squeezed within the 20-quid budget, assuming that I took a couple of Spartan picnic lunches on my way down there and on the way back. I noticed, incidentally, there were a number of such establishments advertising themselves, especially in Scotland. I was greeted on my arrival at the rectory as though in some private country house by a tumbling mass of dogs, and I was led to my room furnished with antiques and fresh flowers which looked out over lawn and cedar trees to the village church. Meals didn't come from an elaborate menu but were limited to a single main dish. But what dishes? Turkey breast cooked with almonds or herb, lemon and cream sauce, sole and mushrooms and mussels, strawberry peach salad and orange rum gatto to remember but a few. In a moment, between courses, I spoke to the proprietor, Captain Barker. Well, after all these splendid meals, I'd be very happy just to sit in my room with a sort of glazed look in my eye and do absolutely nothing. But for anybody who does come down here for a holiday, what are the sort of things they can do in the countryside around here? Well, I think, personally, the main thing about it is the actual countryside itself. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to walk and sort of go and look at things and um, that sort of thing. Um, there are also 
a lot of very attractive and old churches, a certain amount of castles, and as I say, some very lovely countryside, which is unspoiled. For people who want to ride, is there any sort of riding stables or anything like that? Yes, there are. There are one or two riding stables about. But basically, you try and run the hotel as a, a private country house, do you? As far as possible, this is the idea, yes. Obviously, things are going to be tighter if you want to go abroad on £20. Impossible, I hear your retort. Well, surprisingly enough, not. This depends almost entirely on the fact that Hoverloyd offer a service from Ramsgate to Calais by which you pay only for a car to cross. People in it, up to seven, go free. So that theoretically, by packing a small car full, you can get across for under three quid each, leaving 17 pounds to play around with. A feasible proposition if you check in at one of France's 610 auberges de vacances, where full pension is as little as 20 francs a day, or about 30 bob. Alternatively, the tourist authorities in Calais will recommend cheap pensions in non-registered hotels. In one typical cheap hotel near Calais, I had one of the best dishes of duck cooked in shaggy lumps of orange that I've ever had. Another alternative would be to rent a villa in the neighbourhood, which works out at about four pounds a head, which, according to Monsieur Lassaud of Calais, leaves more than enough over for food. Uh, from my personal experience, family experience, I, I would say that uh, for a medi medium-sized family, where it's say five, six people, uh, five francs per person would be sufficient. Of course, uh, without uh, any luxury item, but I mean, basic, basic food, uh, five, five francs is uh, quite a normal yeah. sum of money, adequate, yes. So one wouldn't be absolutely, at the, you know, scrimping on... Starving, five. starving on five francs, certainly not. No, no, no. Hints there for a fairly cheap holiday from Tim Matthews. Well, today, the 7th European Rheumatology Congress opens at Brighton and focuses attention on a disease known by a variety of light-hearted euphemisms like weaver's bottom, housewife's knee or drinker's elbow. Each of us knows someone with something of that sort of complaint, so Ken Sakura asked the Deputy Medical Secretary of the Arthritis and Rheumatism Council, which is organising the Congress, how widespread a problem rheumatoid arthritis was. The the problem of arthritis is very widespread and it is reckoned that between one and two people out of every three will get some form of rheumatic complaint during their lifetime and as years go by then the likelihood for the individual is greater. But this is using arthritis in the widest possible sense because arthritis is not a single disease process. It is a, a term which covers an enormous field a very large number of um, complaints from the trivial, but nevertheless very uncomfortable, uh, to the very severe, disabling, crippling, and sometimes life endangering. Is there any point in trying to define what arthritis is? I think so. Um, in general parlance, arthritis tends to be any pain arising from the locomotor system by which one means the part of one's body which allows one to move. So basically joints, but also the tendons, ligaments, and so on, around the joints. In the medical sense, arthritis, as a strict term, means an actual inflammatory disease of the joint itself. Is this the same thing when people, for instance, out in the country where I live, they call it a, a screws, a touch of the screws or the yes. twinges. Now, what, what, are the, what can they do about this? I think the first thing that must be done about this is that a firm diagnosis must be um, reached. So this does mean that if their symptoms are bothering them, then they must take themselves off to their own doctor uh, and seek professional advice. Because one cannot make a diagnosis uh, from a term like the screws mm. without seeing the patient and going over them fairly thoroughly and perhaps performing the appropriate x-rays or blood tests to reach a firm diagnosis because to some extent the treatment of the different arthritic complaints is different depending on what sort happens to be present. Are the normal family doctors well equipped to understand this as it's so widespread? I think the answer is increasingly well equipped. Be uh, and this stems from a number of means of contact. First of all, rheumatology is taught 
in the majority of medical schools nowadays, so that the medical people who have qualified more recently have had some tuition in it, as they have in most other branches of medicine. Secondly, information is being gathered the whole time. Uh, we do know a lot more about the arthritic complaints, although we cannot cl claim to know the whole story by any means. And many, organisa many organisations, in particular the Arthritis and Rheumatism Council, act as educational organisations in that they send out leaflets and instruction booklets and so on to general practitioners, to anybody who's interested in the medical field, uh, to tell them about modern ideas, recent developments. Is there anything that uh, we can do to prevent the onset of uh, these complaints? Most of the inflammatory ones, unfortunately, no, uh, in our present state of knowledge, because this stems from the fact that we don't know definitely the cause of the inflammatory joint diseases. But in that we don't know the cause, then of course we cannot entirely prevent it at the moment. The ones that are more associated with activity, then one can prevent many of the joint troubles, like slip discs, by an awareness of the fact that they occur and by taking suitable precautions, uh, for example, teaching people how to lift correctly so as to place as little uh, stress on their back as they can. That sort of simple manoeuvre. But in the sense of giving uh, injections, pills and this type of medicine as a preventative, no, we're not there yet. And now, what's on your mind? Mrs June Main of Biggin Hill in Kent has been driven to desperation and now makes a suggestion that's bound to strike a chord of response with many of you. May I, a non-smoker, make a suggestion regarding the proposed banning of smoking in public houses? As the old public and saloon bars now seem to be a thing of the past, can't we have a smokers and non-smokers? This would still give the customers a choice as to which bar they prefer, with a non-smoking girlfriend accompanying her boyfriend if he smokes in the smokers, or if they're saving to get married, he goes with her into the non-smokers. If I go into a pub with family or friends, within half an hour I'm almost blinded by smoke. Stinging red eyes, usually a blinding headache, and feeling thoroughly miserable. I've tried wearing dark glasses, but it doesn't work, and I simply feel like a spy in a fourth-rate drama. Well, now, curiously enough, Mrs Main, this morning one of the big breweries has, has announced that they're going to do almost exactly as you suggest. Smokers will be banned in one of their bars as from tomorrow, Tuesday. They're trying it as a six-month experiment, and if it's successful, they'll restrict smoke in their smoking in their other 3,200 pubs. So it looks as if you'll be able to take off those dark glasses after all in time. Mrs Margaret Lation has written asking for information, and her letter comes from Newport, Monmouthshire. My husband uses a hearing aid, Ministry of Health variety, and has to wear a waistcoat in order to clip the microphone into the right breast pocket. This is fine in the winter, but it's most uncomfortable in the warm weather, as he has to keep his jacket on as well to cover the waistcoat. I'd like to make a harness of webbing that he could wear under his shirt, if possible, but have no idea how to set about it. I'd be most grateful for any suggestions that would help him to keep cool in the summer. Well, here's one. The Royal National Institute for the Deaf has on sale at 15 pence small sachets, which look like purses, for carrying body-worn hearing aids either in the breast pocket or by an adjustable cord around the neck. The reason they're produced is that they reduce the friction noise or static from the rubbing of clothes. They could be worn possibly round the neck during summer by your husband. Now, you may have heard an item in the programme the other day giving some hints about how to cope in the really very hot weather. P.D. Wells of Hearn Bay certainly heard it and writes, Your programme on keeping cool prompts me to write to see if you've any advice on the opposite, how to keep warm. Most men by this time of year have discarded their overcoats, have taken to summer clothes and start complaining of the heat. I'm one of a minority that always feels cold except in the hottest weather, and pleasant sea breezes to others and nasty cold winds to me, and I feel conspicuous in my overcoat and heavy clothes. I wonder if you've any advice for the likes of me. Well, have you? Perhaps, indeed, we can broadcast them in tomorrow's edition of You and Yours, which will be, of course, as usual, at 12 noon.